PERPETUAL HYPE! This video and all videos on this channel brought to you with channelfireball.com so if you're looking to pre-order any of the cards from Kaldeheim, 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 then check out the link in the description below to Channel Fireball and use the code KENOBI to support the channel. It's perpetual hype time! Spoiler season has started and that means for 2021 now it will probably never leave up. I'm Vince, also known as Peasant Kenobi on the internet. It's Kaldeheim preview season. This is YouTube. Let's talk about it. I've got a preview coming next week. I think it's next week. Yes, I'm revealing a spoiler on the 14th. It's not an exciting one. They never send me exciting stuff. I even asked them why. Why do I get looked over for rares? Guess I'm just not cool enough. First up, we have the Swole One-Eyed Bold Daddy, also known as Ulrund, God of the Cosmos. The first time I read an actual Cosmopolitan article, it was the one doing the rounds about making girls squirt. What that's got to do with sensual beer daddy is beyond me. Oh. 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 His front side is what they used to call a marrow, a creature that gets bigger for the number of cards in hand. It also gets to increase the number of foretold cards that are in exile. It also, at end of turn, allows you to speculatively name a card type and potentially draw them. Okay, interesting. His backside is a 2 mana 2-3 two, crow, so it's like a storm crow on crack, that when it does damage to the opponent, it bounces back to hand and you scry two. My first thought upon seeing the back half of this card, the 2 mana 2-3 two, flyer that scries two upon combat, was that it was quite pushed. But the bounce back to hand is mandatory, so I think that's actually a real downside. Or at least it's meant to be a downside. My first thought was, why does blue just get easily castable 2 threes for 2 that a mode will have a god mode on the back and squire 2 when they hit people? Oh my god, what's he, what are you doing? Why do you hate white? Shake my head. But then I realised the bounce back to hand clause is mandatory, and you can't opt against it, making this a bad in tempo or aggro decks in theory. If you are being aggressive, or you're trying to use your mana in a more effective way than your opponent, then replaying the bird is pretty garbage. But then I thought, what if it connects and ensures that your Delver flips next turn? And then it gives you a 4 mana card advantage engine that can just name instant or sorcery in a legacy Delver deck and at least draw you a singular card. Ah, maybe. I think the front half being a bouncy bounce tempo loss does make it a little fairer, and the backside's body with no protection actually might just suck. The front side scry can set up the backside to draw you the cards. So on turn four, you can swing, hit, scry, put it back in your hand, cast it as the god, end of turn, draw two cards. So that's nice. I think it's a nice design. The other hotness of this card, as pointed out by my wonderful patron Fuzzy, whilst he sucked at Rainbow Six last night, the ketchup on pizza loving bastard, he said if you can attack with this, trigger the bird, and then on the stack, flicker it, you get the god, and then obviously, the like I said, the scry sets up the draws. You can do this with something like Ephemerate. The fact that god side is good, but not extremely pushed, makes this feel not too obnoxious, but I certainly want to try doing this in some sort of soul herder deck in modern. Next! Valky, God of Lies. God of Lies. His flavor text should be something like, White does get to do its own powerful things. Honest, am I right? It's a 2 mana 2 1 that ETBs to temporarily exile a creature from each opponent's hand, each being the operative word there because it means it's good in commander. I say good, it has more application in commander. He can then become one of those creatures for X, where X is equal to its CMC. Its flip side is a considerably powerful Tybalt Planeswalker that doesn't have a chaos effect on him, so one of my Kaldaheim predictions was fucking wrong. Fuck my life. The front half is comparable to Tide Hollow Scholar or Freeboater in terms of cards that see play in other formats. Historically, not being able to take, let's say, a removal spell from a hand to protect the body is bad. There's nothing worse than looking at your opponent's hand and seeing a fatal push or a plowshares or similar, and then they just fatal push or plowshares your guy and get their creature back. So it's just a one form. Also, spells tend to be more powerful in older formats like modern and legacy than creatures do. However, let's look forward to the future of magic. Creatures are progressively being pushed more and more and more. Euros and Omnaths are starting to make the last 20 years of spells look like complete dog shit. Furthermore, with adventure cards like the fucking giant, that's also a two damage burn spell, or the uh, the murderous rider, that's also a kill spell, we're going to see a lot more creatures that double up as spells, either in adventure style mechanics or modal double face cards. I guarantee in the next year or two we'll get modal double face creature and remove a spell. If the creature side tends to be on the front or the main part of the card in the case of the adventure cards, then this thing will be able to take those. What I'm getting at is that I think this card taking creatures historically isn't as good, but as time goes on and we push creatures further and further and they start to double up as removal spells too, I think taking creatures will be strong, if not stronger, given time. This might actually end up being better for taking creatures in the long run and indefinitely in formats like Standard or Pioneer or maybe even Historic. 
The flip side is this huge 7 mana 5 loyalty tip out Chad, who upticks by 2 to exile top 2 cards, uh, top, top card of each player's library, and minus 3s to exile a creature or an artifact. Beyond that, he of course has a paragraph for a static ability at the top, and a, uh, an ultimate that I would say doesn't matter too much, but it's only 2 ticks away from doing, and it gives you mana as well as exiling all graveyards, so it's pretty strong. The static ability says that he can cast any cards he has exiled, um, and you can spend mana as if it was any colour. Now, importantly, it's not a literal static on the card. It's actually an ETB make an emblem with a static ability. So this is a static ability on a Planeswalker that stays after the Planeswalker has died. Can you imagine if... I mean, I'm assuming this is being used to make Tybalt less of a feel bad when you play it yourself and make it more fun. And I like that. But can you imagine if they use this templating for a Narset or Khan or, or Teferi of, that we saw in War of the Spark, a one-sided, staxy, rules-changing effect on an emblem? I would assume they wouldn't, but it does put the fear of God or gods into me. Get it? Because the sets full of gods. Either way, that's some scary shit. If this was a 7 mana Planeswalker with no front half, it would be probably unplayable. If it was a 2 drop creature freebooter on the front with no backside, it would be borderline unplayable. The fact that this is a creature disruptive threat on the front, and a 7 CMC value engine monster on the back, makes it quite solid I feel. 7 mana is a lot for the older format, so I doubt this will see play anywhere outside of someone fucking about with Rectifit in Legacy for example, but I can see this seeing some sort of play in Standard and Historic. Like, both sides are relatively good, and then when you combine them, it's like a multiplication. It gets a lot better when you fill two slots in your curve. I also really like the design of the front. It being a 2-1 makes it die to literally any and every removal spell ever, or at least since they stop printing cards that can't kill black creatures. It's a nice piece of balance for a card that can fill in like multiple roles. Beyond that, Lurus can cast the front half from the graveyard, and you can play this in your Lurus deck. So you can have a, a an aggressive or attrition-based Lurus deck like the sacrifice decks we've seen, but also have a Rakdos 7 mana planeswalk on the back end that you can cast in the late game if somehow you get to 7 mana and you haven't killed your opponent. You can also cascade into the front half of a Shardless Agent or a Bloodbraid Elf and decide or opt to cast the back half, that's just how the rules work. So that's got to be material for at least one video or stream, right? NEXT! Goldspan Dragon is a 5 CMC 4-4 with flying and haste, and when it attacks or is targeted, make a treasure token, and it makes all treasure tokens crack for 2. That's a lot of good text on a card, it's solid, it's cool. The reason I mention it here, or bring it up, is that I'm a little sad as I really want to see treasures eventually become part of White's Colour Pie in the post-Smothering Tithe world. I know that, uh, that people at Wizards have said Smothering Tithe was an outlier, it was a one-off, but I have to ask the question, why? Lotus Petal to me feels white adjacent. Whilst we see it played in blue and red decks and legacy, the fact that we have um, archaeology as part of like white's thematic colour pie, cards like Tesha, cards like um, uh, the Bomb Man one, what's it called? Uh, uh, Salvages, all that sort of stuff. It feels like Lotus Petal is more adjacent to white, so that the treasure tokens, which are effectively Lotus Petals, I feel it like could have been a space they could have explored for white to give it something else to do, whilst all the other colours are doing practically everything. But alas, red has it now. Cool card, but sad to see a recently grown space be pushed to another colour that isn't white. Next! Vorinclex is finally real and true, and it's here, and it's down to Fuck. This card is fucking awesome. Firstly, I am so psyched to see the existence of Phyrexians outside of their plane. Interplanar Phyrexian Threat is something I have been excited for for a while. I spoke about it in videos and on streams. It's fucking sick and I can't wait. Hear, hear me out here. I can't wait for them to go back to the meditation room and go, Bolus, we need your help. You know, like when people go and get like, they, they break out the previous film's villain to be used against the next villain because the next villain is an insurmountable threat. I think we'll see that. I think we'll see... Oath of Bolus, as Bolus is inducted, at least temporarily, into the Gatewatch to fight against the Phyrexians, and he turns upon them at the final moment. I am fucking hyped for this. This is a 6-6 six, six for 6 with two whole keywords, both Trample and Haste, already making it a reasonable magic card if a little bit unexciting for a 6 mana mythic. But then it has the counters part of Dublin Season for you, and a reduction of that for the opponent. In short, whenever a counter is put on one of your permanents or yourself, it is doubled, and when it's put on an opponent's permanents, it is halved rounding down. This is a sweet callback to the doubling and halving of mana that the old one did. This is a doubling season with a body. It's worse in Commander because doubling 
season is good with tokens there, where people play token strategies, but is better everywhere else because of the counter element. The fringe decks in modern that I've played off of Dublin season are the Planeswalker decks. And this guy does the same thing with Planeswalkers. Play an Ugin and immediately ultimate it. Hit more walkers, perhaps a Tamiyo, or ultimate that too, and then cast another walker. The reason for this is that when walkers come into play, they come into play with double their starting loyalty thanks to Vorinclex. This is insane, and it's an instant win with many Planeswalkers, usually outside of green, but still very strong within just mono green if you want him in the command zone. Meanwhile, in modern, for example, your opponent's Baby Teferi enters with only two counters and can't even bounce the Vorinclex. Opponent's walkers that tick up by one actually don't gain loyalty as it's rounded down, which I think is fucking awesome. The original Vorinclex is one of my least favourite commander cards. I hate it. I could see that if it was banned, I would say good riddance to bad rubbish. It's just a feel bad, slow down the game, punishes the player that deals with it is the bit that I hate. The person who's got the removal gets punished the most by it. I just don't like foreign clicks. This one, on the other hand, feels cool and powerful, but not as feel bad. Like, if it ends the game there and then, I don't give a fuck. If it allows you to combo off, cool. But the old Warren Clex, I felt, slowed games down and felt incredibly unfair to people who are actually playing Interaction. The fact this is a doubling season for Modern, for example, that actually has offensive stats and can kill on its own. You can just slam it on, on turn 5 or 4 or 6 or whatever you've got the mana for it and attack with a 6-6 six, six Trampler is actually pretty good. It being a creature means it's easier to cheat into play. It's easier to tutor for than an enchantment like doubling season. It does cost one more mana, but at least it's not a do-nothing rip off the top of your deck. The Phyrexian frame looks fucking amazing and if this is as rare as i'm expecting it to be if it's only available in like set boosters and it's probably at like a slightly rarer rarity and stuff and there's foil versions of it the foil phyrexian one will command a huge price tag in foil like i really want one of these like real fucking bad the good news is what tends to happen with these multiple frame things is that the most expensive version the most sought after version commands the price tag and it pulls the price tag of the other ones down because they're not as desirable so that's a good thing in many ways Vorin Clex also continues the proud tradition of having green rares and mythics have so much text that takes you approximately 15 minutes to finish reading them next our runs epiphanies a seven cmc take an extra turn spell that gives you two fucking birds you know what they say two birds on a spell is worth more than them in a, a bush. Something about this, the fact that it makes just two random 1-1 one, one birds, is hilarious to me. I know it's thematically part of this god's identity, I get that, but birds are funny anyway. The idea that you can group block down a bear, a literal fucking bear, with two crows, or better yet, like pigeons or canaries, is just incredible. I love it. I love the idea of two doves fucking you up, just pecking at your eyes. Turn after turn. Seven mana extra turn, two squawky boys. It seems meh, honestly, but it also has Fortel, which is a new mechanic. It allows you to exile it from hand face down after two mana earlier in the game to reduce its cost later, in this case by one. So you pay two mana now on turn two, and you get it for six mana later on on turn six. It's a cool idea, but this card is still a bit meh. People are, of course, comparing it inevitably to Nexus of Fate, one of the banes of Stan, because similar mana costs similar effect, right? But y'all need to stop. It is time to stop. Nexus tried to stop itself from being recurrable by shuffling itself back in, which in essence made it recurrable in a longer form way. You would just redraw it over time, and that sucked. This one goes back to the tried and tested way of exiling itself from the game. They learn from past mistakes, people. They are learning and improving, and I want to point at that and be like, good, that's good. This card isn't going to rock the world, even in something ramping relatively hard. Where I can see it being interesting, or maybe a problem, is anywhere that is looking for a critical mass, or even just an extra copy of, or a new copy of, an extra turn spell that I can cast for free. I have played uh, the Genesis Ultimatum deck on the channel before at the beginning of Zendikar Rising Standard when Omnath existed. It's a very fun deck that had some incredibly explosive draws. Now, Omnath is gone, of course, but the deck still exists in some form. Genesis Ultimatum is quite the absurd magic card. Add some extra turn spells that you can hit off of it and cast one of those and go again. And Bob's your uncle and Fanny is your aunt, as they say in Bristol. Next! Reflections of Lichara is fucking cool. Choose a creature type, and when you cast one, copy it. I haven't played ETB Wizard Tribal in EDH in a long time, but this makes me want to rebuild it real bad, especially if I can then, like, 
bounce some of those wizards back to hand, the original copies to cast again. There must be so many easy combos with this card as well. Like within seconds, I was like, well, what about the colorless statue artifact thing that Animal uses to go infinite and now makes infinite bodies if you name Golem? Beyond, like, the a million infinite combo variants you can do with this fucking thing, I also think this would be sick in an elemental deck as well. Copies of elementals with, like, with Vision Reef out would be amazing, or copies of Mole Drifter, Flicker Wisp, or even just Omnaths. Fucking value. NEXT! Old Growth Troll! Another green rare, another wall of text. It is a 4 4 with trample because you can go above the rate when it's hard to cast, but wait! When it dies, it becomes an abundant growth that can also sack the land to make a 4-4 four four with trample. So it's actually a better than that, that furry wolf pillow haven thing. At first glance, this card seems fucking insane. Is this a new cycle, similar to Dominaria ones? Will the white one actually be good? Only time will tell. But honestly, the funny thing about contemporary design is that no matter how pushed and fucking absurd a card feels on first glance, it might have already been outclassed in the last year or so. This card, in standard, can't even attack through a lovestruck beast. Like, stop and think about that for a moment. This 4-4 trampler for 3 mana, with value-based upside that replaces itself over time isn't going to see much play whilst a three mana five five from the last year is still in standard like go back and show this to a magic player only three years ago and they would think this is some sort of far-fetched joke or hyperbole about power creep neither of these cards are breaking magic and neither of them are cards that i want to like complain about like on mass and this might be more of a concern for standard but it is at least a weird place for mtg design to be next Glimpse the Cosmos is our first hint at a giant tribal card alongside that shitty saga, and it's got me a little tense. It's a 2 CMC anticipated sorcery speed, okay, not great, and it can be cast from the graveyard for 1 mana, giving essentially a flashback cost for 1 mana if you control a giant. Some of you might be thinking, who the fuck cares, seems above average at best, until you realise it plays pretty well with Uro, who is a fucking giant. Now, Uro has been banned in multiple formats, and this isn't really the straw that breaks the camel's back as such, as Uro continues to dominate older formats like Legacy, this kind of thing is more insult to injury, as those decks could play this to continue to outvalue everyone at every opportunity. But 2 CMC is probably too expensive for this effect in Legacy, but if this is the uncommon payoff, I am terrified to see the rare or mythic payoff of having a giant in play. On the upside though, at least it won't be randomly a cost reduced extra turn spell because that is a well we've already drank from, the one with the fucking birds on it. NEXT! Nico Aris is a 3 CMC with an X cost stuck onto them. The ETB is to get X number of shard tokens. Ticks down, you get a shard token. Tick down to deal 2 damage to a tapped creature equal to the number of cards drawn. An uptick to give unblockable to a creature and might deal damage to an uh, opponent, but turn it to its owner's hand. This is a super interesting walker design. Firstly, we should explain what shards do as we haven't seen them yet. We haven't actually seen the card yet, but we know there are enchantment tokens that have Two mana, tap and sack, scry one, and then draw a card. So functionally better clues, but with a different type of synergies. They play well with Constellation from Theros, because that's where um, Nico is meant to be from. And uh, yeah, older formats have things like Sarah Sanctum and stuff as well, I guess. I do want to take a moment here to say, again, enchantments feel like a white thing, right? And Aris had to be blue because they dare to allow you to have card advantage to draw literal cards uh, from what's on the board. Meanwhile, Tyler's Tracker, which, you know, the one that made clues, is mono green and draws cards because green gets to draw cards because lands were involved at some point, right? If you're playing lands, you get to draw cards as green. Aris has been compared, I've seen, to Sphinx of Emulation, which isn't useful in my opinion. The card draw comparison is wrong there, as each card will cost you effectively three mana to draw one for each shard cracked, making it miles apart in terms of, like, rate as Revelation. However, if the shard ETB constellation can't be abused, I think Nico might see virtually no play anywhere. Their starting loyalty is low, they struggle to protect themselves as the damage is only to tapped creatures, and like I said, it's not really a, as good a rate or anywhere near as good a rate as something like Sphinx's Rev. Super interesting concept, mechanically lacking in power, it is comparable to Tireless Tracker in many ways, same CMC at 3, a little bit extra if you want to pay it for 4 in the next turn, like you will Tracker sometimes to make sure you hit your land drop, but Tracker gets bigger, it attacks and it blocks and it plays well with fetch lands, Nico on the other hand, they don't do any of those things. I guess they soak up some damage for an attack, I don't think this card's very good. NEXT! Snowlands are back.
Before I get on my high horse, let's just highlight how wonderful they look. The art, as it often is in Magic, is incredible, so a huge credit to all of the artists and the art director there. But beyond that, these frames are incredible. The frosted text box and icy desaturation is just phenomenal. They look physically cold to touch. They will evoke a feeling of a frozen environment in limited and standard, and I love that. I love that the game pieces are going beyond, and they have in the past as well, but going beyond the art to evoke a feel, an environment, and a aesthetic. And that's the problem, there's some things that aren't applauded enough in Magic, because the game design has been such a mixed bag as of late, is that the visual side of Magic is absolutely at the front of its class. From art to asset design, Magic is an incredibly well made game that manages to avoid feeling cheap like a lot of other big card games do. Okay, I've gushed. Let's talk about Snow in a bit more detail. Astrolabe has poisoned the well for many eternal and non-rotating players. Snow is all upside with minimal to absolutely no downside for those choosing to tech into it with their deck choices. Beyond that, having the existence of Snowlands and only a handful of art choices compared to the literal metric shit ton of normal basic choices pushes players away from the aesthetic or cosmetic choices that they could make with what lands they play in decks, which essentially homogenizes not only the card seeing play, but the look and feel of magic. It's kind of ironic that I sit here and compliment the visual and art direction of magic when the existence, there's the sheer existence of Snowlands and themselves, like reduces your options in terms of customizing your deck and the way your deck looks. There's a, a sad irony to that. In short, if Snow comes with an upside that makes it pointless not to play, then there needs to be a clear and painful counterplay strategy available. If there's a good payoff, there should be some way to punish playing Snow. A Blood Moon or Boil for Snowlands is an obvious one, but something Wizards are terrified of doing now. They're so against taking resources away from you. I might even make a short video talking about the problem with Snow in a bit more detail. Probably just labelling the point I just made. Because it does bug me. Like, there's so many cool lands out there. Think about the lands that were in Jumpstart with all the flavorful thematic things. The Squirrel ones from Unhinged, the Goblin ones from Jumpstart. And then it's like, well, actually, I probably should be playing Snow. It sucks. And then kinda next, fetchable snow jewels that eat to be tapped at common. At first glance, I was actually fucking shocked these exist. These are categorically, hands down, bar none, the best common non-basics we've ever seen. There is no reason not to play Snowlands at present time. These are fetchable off of Jewels and Farseek and Wood Elves and similar because they're typed. They have a land type on them. So the ETB tapped element of the card is negligible because you can fetch them ahead of time so you don't draw them. And they're common. Pawpaw already plays ETB tapped non-typed Jewels on purpose. All I can say is thank fuck days is banned as the only card I can think that cares about you having islands in play uh, that sees play in Pawpaw. I could be wrong. Nothing else came to mind. But Scred gets an easily splashable colour now, where the lands don't make your Screds worse. But honestly, I'll probably play Rhinewood Falls in my Tatcha over Camana deck, another named land to help with Fear of the Dead, and another excuse to get these ice frames in foil into my deck. And that's a point, these cards, these ice frames, should look mwah, beautiful in foil. I'm kind of a little bit scared that we might have some of the issues we've had recently where the falling is incredibly dark and it might ruin an otherwise fantastic art direction. This is the problem, right? There are people who are making these frames. There are people that are designing the foil treatment, like where the foils pop and stuff on the cards, and then the quality of the cards coming to the printers completely dismantles all that. And that is a crying shame. Someone is working their fucking heart out, and then the quality control or quality assurance at Wizards, or just the skipping corners and quality assurance, just fucks it. And if the snow payoffs are anything like Coatl or Astrolabe in this set, we're in for potential format warping. And if they are good, I can see people playing these cards, showing up as a one-of in modern uh, like uh, mana bases where you can just fetch them end of turn. In modern, it's very common to fetch a tapped Shockland at end of turn in your three-color deck. So why not have one of these available to, I don't know, up the name count for your Field of the field of the Dead or, or give you access to snow for your snow cards if snow becomes an omnipresent thing? And whilst it might sound like I'm complaining because I'm a little bit scared of what Snow might do to like the older formats and stuff like that, there is a positive to take away from this. This is a common, like, typed land cycle. These could have easily been uncommon. These could have been. Wizard of the Coast could have put these at rare and argued because Snow is such an upside, they needed to be. They could have strapped gain one life for them. They've got typed lands that gain life, which is a complete thing we've never seen before. They could have put those at rare. Do you remember when Strylands came out? The ATP scribe temples from Theros. If you don't remember, people were fucking mad that those were rare. And then afterwards, when we realized how good they were, people were like, huh, I guess they should have been rare. 
And I argue no. <laughs> Land should be at common on uncommon where he can. The fact that Wizards did this is actually a commendable thing because it gives people fetchable lands on a super, super budget element for their commander decks. And I think that's fantastic. So, yeah. On the whole, I'm actually excited for these. I think these are great. I'm just scared of snow. So what do you think so far? Am I being too exaggerative about some of the things I think are strong? Do you think I've really misjudged any of these cards? Do you think my constant being that white doesn't get anything good is unjustified because we got Skyclave Apparition in the last set and that's good enough? That's good enough? Let me know in the comment section below. Don't forget to hit that like button, smash that bell, subscribe, and stay tuned for more talk of spoilers, more magic stuff, more modern gameplay, more EDH, just more magic in general, and on Wednesdays, some Warhammer 2. I've been Vince, also on this on the internet. I'll see you all soon. Think of me when you're knocking one out next time. Ta-ta for now. Bye.